it's uh, it's time, it's time. Okay, so um, here we are uh, to this talk. You get the the, the analogy here with the orchestration. So this talk is named Refactoring from Callback Hell to Observables. Uh, probably mo many of you know about the Callback Hell. Uh, the code example, actually this will be a live coding session in which I will pair program. I will program one after the other with, with Marianne. Uh, so, so we have a lot of things to cover, so let's get started. First of all, a uh, quick introduction. Who am I? Uh, I'm Victor Enta, I'm a Java champion, thus I would be the backend guy today. Um, I'm a lead architect at IBM and I do weird stuff there, uh, including uh, pair programming. How many of you ever tried pair programming? Huh? Huh? Good, good, love you guys. Pair programming, clean code, refactoring, test-driven development, weird things, I admit, weird things. Then, uh, I, I, I like these so much that I even started uh, our own community that we can see even on the banner, even on your badge, it's, it's this sign, this is a feather. Yes. Software craftsmanship, the quality, the, the quality code requires strength and a sense of aesthetics. So, I've been talking quite a lot until now, uh, mostly on the clean code topics, but the point of this slide is that these talks are recorded and you can see them on my website. So the point of the slide is that I have a website. Okay, that's it. Good, yeah. Now, uh, what I really want to do, like to do most of the time is training. So I've started several years ago uh, with backing technologies, okay, Spring, Hibernate, Java 8, and then design patterns in, in Polytechnic I teach, architecture, TTDD, clean code. Yeah, a lot of things that you can find on my website, but the most important part of this slide is, of course, in the corner. I post daily on these three social networks things that I learn myself, things that I see and hear, and fun stuff. That's me. Now, Marian. Uh, my name is Marian Stanciu. Uh, I uh, am a technical team lead at uh, IBM and uh, also a full stack developer. Uh, but uh, I'm the one that they call the front-end guy huh? in my team. Uh, uh, this is the first time I'm talking at a conference, uh, but mm -hmm. I did have some uh, uh, internal uh, trainings at IBM. Cool. So, uh, he's the first, he's his first time. This, this is his first time. So, but you get the point? Uh, this is why we're here, because uh, he's the front-end guy. So. Let's see, first of all, let me see you, let me tell you this, JavaScript is single-threaded, surprise, surprise, right? So you all know, even loop, this is easy, right? And some think this is a bad thing, but you, you do realize that this saves you from race conditions. So it's not necessarily a bad thing in, in the end, right? Actually, all the GUI frameworks are single-threaded. But the problem comes when you want to do, you know, single thread multiple things, like background tasks, like we do right now on we, when we do a REST call. Is, you, do you get this, this, this metaphor? REST calls at the spa. Huh? Okay, so when you do a single page app, then you'll do some REST calls, and there you go, you have background tasks that you have to coordinate using, however, one single thread. This equals to callbacks. You don't have other, another option than to serialize the execution of the, the callbacks for all those background tasks on one single thread in the event loop. But you, you, you probably all of you know that already. And you, all, and you also know that this hurts. That you look at some code and you cannot follow, possibly follow the control flow because it is very fragmented of all those callbacks and things going on happening apparently in parallel, but actually on a single thread. So this is the challenge of today. Now, let me introduce you directly in the domain of our application. So this will be live coding, folks, so live coding. First of all, the first part of the exercise would be to have this two requests, two REST requests to get the current user and the countries, the list of countries from the back end. When both of them are here, I want to fill the combo box there and pre-select the user country, right? Because the user has this uh, country in, the, in, it, in his profile. Then the next thing I would like to do is to load the cities for this country. Cascading combo boxes. Ooh. 
and then when I select a, a city, I will need to download the store, the, yeah, the store for those cities. Oh yeah. So three cascading combo boxes. Okay. This will be the first exercise. The second exercise will be when we click submit. The first thing that should happen is to validate the the received ID, Bufu from Carrefour. You know, Bufu. The, bo um, the point is the receipt ID, the unique ID of, the, of your bill, to validate with the server side. If the server says it's OK, then to ask the confirmation from the user. And then, only if, the, if he presses OK, should continue and actually do the post to request the coupon from the server, after which you want to put it on the user interface. Okay? This is the flow. Two requests and one user interaction here, and then two asynchronous requests that must continue with only with a single flow. This is a join operator from UML. Who the heck knows UML, right? Still, let me uh, show you the application. Oh yes, oh yes, the <coughs> application. This is the application, my friends. It has incredible three combo boxes. Yes, but you all know how you can get fast money, right? Just press F12. So if you want to get some quick money, your career might start with F12. I'm not sure if you get the joke, but... Uh. <laughs> anyway, so um, if you press F12 and you reload the page, what you will see is the request first for the current user, telling that the country ID for the user is one, then in parallel with that, a request to, the, to Romania to, to get the, li the, the list of countries. Then this combo box is, is filled in and pre-selected. So the next thing that happens is the cities are requested for the, uh, the country Romania, as you can see here. The cities come back, and the first one is pre-selected, and then the, the stores are requested based on the city one, which is, of course, Bucharest. So then uh, the store list is, uh, comes back from the server, as you can see right here. Now, if you change the country to Hungary, probably, then you'll have Budapest here. If you change it back to Romania, you can see that everything is reloaded again dynamically and new requests are done to the server. Excellent. Oh, however, if you change the city, we have a bug. You see the bug? Nothing changes. Oops. So there is a, you have also to do a, quick, a bug fix there. But, so this is the user interface, okay? Now, uh, I will let uh, Marianne introduce you to the rest of the stuff. Actually, I think you need this, right? And I will, uh, I will do it. I will do it here, and I will just stay like this. Uh, I think uh, most of you uh, know about Swagger. Uh, it's a tool that uh, generates uh, documentation for our API. Uh, here we can see that uh, we have two controllers. And for each controller, we can see all the endpoints that uh, are available to us. We can see the endpoint, the parameters that are required to call this endpoint, and uh, also the data structure that we will get back uh, when we call this endpoint. Also, uh, in Swagger, we, um, we get the models that are, are actually all the data structure that uh, are used in our API. Um, and Swagger generates this interface based on uh, documentation that it's actually a JSON file. And uh, we, based on, the, on that JSON uh, file, we managed to create a tool that generates our um, Angular uh, services. So uh, as you can see, for uh, each controller in uh, the Swagger interface, uh, we have here an, um, an Angular service. For uh, App API, we have uh, four endpoints. We have all the information here with the parameters that we extracted from the JSON. And in the user API, we only have one endpoint to get the current user. Also, we are uh, generating the data structures uh, based on the the same documentation. Also, I will show you how easy it is to... Uh, Wait, I don't think that they got it. We did not write this by hand, right? Yeah. You all know the, on those AshChart auto-generator. What the heck is that, right? So, this guy wrote a generator using AST. 
uh, abstract syntax tree of TypeScript to generate the classes in TypeScript based on the Swagger JSON. <laughs> so now prove it. Come on, come on. Uh, if we go in, uh, in Java and change our one of the data structures in our APIs, let's say that instead of country ID, uh, we have here country code. This is a Spring Boot application. It will restart automatically for us. After the eclipse after a while, of course. It's a, we are an eclipse. <laughs> we are sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, it's still yeah, it's, it's done. It's, it's started. Okay. And uh, if we run our uh, Swagger, Swagger. Uh, if we run our script, we will see that it's uh, uh, actually uh, executing a script using node. And we see that in our DTO, it changed the field from country ID to country code. Did you notice in three seconds? Yeah, good. good. Uh, and also, if we go into, uh, into our controller here, we will see have that uh, we have a compilation error because country ID no longer exists on the user DTO. So we uh, easily can change this uh, without having to actually run the code to see it, if it break anything. I think that's it, right? So it's, it's my turn now. And yeah. let's test to see. No, I'm not sure. Ah, ah will, will it still work? Ah, details. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it is still it's still working after we change our API. So it's like checking at compile time that you are still uh, respecting the API, the, all the parameters and the endpoints. So this kind of problems, um, this kind of problems cost me, I think, around 100 bucks until this guy invented this tool. You know, in JavaScript, you don't aren't sure if you respect the API from the backend. It's a it's a beauty, and they've changed it without notice notifying you, and it's a whole mess. Now we are just running a script. And the code turns red. Yet compilation, you don't need to run it. It's incredible. So I was like, whoa, this is really type safe, right? TypeScript, great. So this is a great idea. Now, uh, since I'm a clean code maniac, as I've put on the slide, I will, I will need to um, <laughs> refactor a bit this. How is it? Control P, right? And then presentation mode? How, is it, how, how do you do that? Control Shift P. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, so, whoa, so redeem, let's read, okay, some, some, some data, nice, and then engine in it, and then, oh my god, what the heck is this? Wait, 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 we are doing two calls, and then what the heck is this? What the heck? Now, coming back to the slide, do you remember that we have this barrier, this, actually, this is it's called um, a join in UML, this stuff. Now, this stuff, <laughs> the developers implementing using this kind of approach. Uh, writing effectively two handlers and in each handler checking whether the other one happened or not. Oh my god. Right? I mean, oh my god. They were just checking whether the other one had the chance to run before me or not. So, first thing we need to fix, of course, is to uh, basically apply the fork join uh, operator, uh, which takes two two observables, so get current user tells me an observable. Uh, by the way, uh, we are in Angular. Okay. <laughs> Good. And then uh, this is that <laughs> uh, get all countries. I wouldn't type for Christ's sake. No, just copy paste. And then this, and then subscribe. And I can subscribe. I, I hope I didn't, I didn't mess anything. Right? Subscribe. And then I need here to take DTOs, two DTOs, and then say arrow, and then the, 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 the beautiful part is when you hover your mouse and you figure out that this is actually a structure containing two things, right? user DTO and counter DTO, an array of DTOs. Okay, so this would mean that this user will actually be equal to DTOs of one. You get the point there of zero because the current user is the first thing we call and then the countries, oops, wrong key. Uh, this will be the DTOs of one, and then it is safe to call this function because we know for sure that both asynchronous operations finished when we do that. So, basically, right now, uh, <laughs> right, uh, what can I say? Uh, Jesus-driven development, right? Let's hope it works. 
So let's just alt tab and refresh. And we are working with the only on the ng init. So if we see things without errors, we are good. So we are good. Next thing, by reading it down, you, we, we soon discover that there is duplication around me. <laughs> I sense duplication, right? Look, 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 oh yeah, look how duplicate. Even the IDE figures out that this is a duplicated line. So basically, this part here, ah, this part here is the same as the one below, here, okay. Then what do we do next? Well, we, we should what? When we see duplicated code, we should extract a method. Thank you. So let's extract a method. I have refactoring in visual code, which is good. I will name this load the stores uh, for, or by current, uh, what's that? City, yes. By current city. Very nicely done. Unfortunately, until now, despite all the plugins that I threw at it, Visual Code does not know to replace it everywhere it sees that syntax, that, 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 that part of the code. So I need to do Jesus development again. Oh my god, I hope it works. Now, let's see. If I change here to Hungary, it works. If I reload again, it, it fills all the combo boxes very nicely. So apparently, I did not break anything yet. Then comes the interesting part. Because I see the same thing happening again. Hey, look, my duplication again, right? Look, cities. You can you see, right? It's right in front of you. So, what should I do then? I should extract a method from here. Then I will probably name this method very wisely a, and then call this function from this other part. But as I do that, I realize one thing: all that is left in this method is only a call to this new method. So I will quickly undo this and figure and think, couldn't I, instead of doing that, couldn't I call that method that I have in this class, couldn't I do that? Well, I could, but I should pass a parameter. What parameter? I should pass the selected country ESO. But wait a second, where should I, where does this come from? Now, let's think a bit. And when, when, we, when I say think, I, and usually in JavaScript, I mean, let's find. So, um, where is this uh, uh, used? Well, look, hi, look, it's in HTML. So look, look, look. On the change for the country selector, it loads again the cities for the current country. But guess what? It passes to the method in the controller a field from the same controller. This is plain stupid. Because the method has access to those fields anyway. So this is plain stupid. This doesn't mean we didn't saw that hundreds of times until now in our project, but this is still plain stupid. It doesn't need a parameter, right? It's in the same class. So I will quickly revert to this solution and I will call the same function here and here very nicely. Um, let's see. Now, since this function is only two lines long, for me, it doesn't worth existing. So I will kill it. This is actually called inline in a, in a, in a, in a, in a decent ID. Uh, and then we don't have it in Visual Studio yet. To my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong. But this now raises another problem. You see, if I look very, very careful, I would see, I know I'm cruel with you and I don't let you and I don't allow you enough time to see for yourself. But this is a talk, right? So the point is, if I analyze what happens with the user field, I notice the user field is only used here and here in one single method. Now, computer science 101, if you need something in a single method, please don't make it a field. Hmm? Eh? Eh? Or not? Eh? Eh? But you say, oh my god, no, we are OOP programmers, we do fields. <laughs> no, if you have something you need to remember, a let is enough. Just let, let it be, let it be, let it be, right? So basically, localize the variables to the narrowest possible scope. It helps a lot with understanding, right? Ooh, ah, will, it, will it still work? Oh my God. Oh, and let's fix the bug. What if, if I change the city? Let's fix it. Where should that be? Well, in the component, for sure, in the HTML, when I change the city, I should as well <laughs> I'm a professional programming. I'm copy pasting code, of course. But then I need to copy here, and I need to put here the handler, the, the load what? Let me see. I need to load the stores by current city. 
I need to load the stores by current city when I modify the current seat. Right? Make sense? Eh? Eh? Okay. But the problem is this is private, and we should make it public to be accessible from HTML. And I save it, and hopefully the bug is gone. Not yet. Let's, re let's re reload again. And there you go. This is a Romanian joke. Okay, good. Um, we don't have a, the uh, seventh uh, highway yet. We only have four. But anyway, the, the, this basically concludes the cleanup of the initialization, I think. And I will. Uh -huh. Okay. And then we okay, after we loaded the data in our pages, we need to take care of the submit form. And uh, the flow here is that uh, when I when the user clicks the submit button, it's actually calling this method on submit click that uh, validates the receipt ID uh, with the backend, and uh, after it gets the response, it uh, uh, opens the confirmation dialog. When the user clicks the yes button, it will actually call the redeem coupon method that uh, hides the confirmation dialog and gets the coupon from backend. This looks uh, pretty good, but it can look even better. Uh, if we um, join these methods and we have uh, all those steps in a single flow, it will be much easier to, to read. It will be nice if we could uh, write something like this. If we, if we could just wait for the validation and then open the dialog, then wait for the user input, and then uh, execute the code in the redeem coupon method. And then here again, when I do the request to the backend to the request coupon, uh, I wanted to just assign the response to a variable like this instead of subscribing and then doing the assignment in the callback. Oops. Uh, what we need here is for a method uh, to wait for the user to click the button. So we need to get a um, reference to the yes button in the confirmation dialog. So we use the Angular local reference. And we also rem remove the the method on the event of the click uh, of the of the button of the event. And then what to say here? We will create a method that says wait for click. And in this uh, method, I want to return a promise. Uh, that gets a resolve function, and I want to put this resolve function on the handle of the click event of the button. But in order to get the button, I need to get the element in my component, and I can do this with view child in Angular, and the name of the local reference that I put in uh, HTML. And what I will get is a uh, reference to that element. Once I have the, the button, I can say uh, yes button from native element. And uh, on the method on click, I want to call my resolve method. And uh, using uh, the TypeScript uh, feature a sync await. Uh, I can uh, suspend the execution of this function uh, any time I'm uh, trying to resolve a promise. So I just have to say await, and this will suspend the execution of the function 
until this promise is resolved. But we also need to make it a promise. And for this to work, we need to mark this uh, method as async by putting the keyword async in front of it. Uh, you can see that uh, it says that it is no longer returns a void, even though we have no return function, because uh, when you put a sync in front of a function, uh, it actually returns a promise. So I can do this for every promise in my function, and uh, the execution will be suspended every time, uh, and it will continue from that point, when the promise is resolved, and when it meets a new promise, it will suspend again and wait for that promise. And also I need to make this one a promise. So now when I'm trying to get the coupon, the confirmation dialog works, so it, that means it made the request to my backend and I also get the coupon back. And uh, you can see now this reads really nicely because uh, it's uh, sequentially, and I can really like this. I validate the receipt, then I show the confirmation dialog, I wait for uh, the user to click the button. When the user click the button, the I hide the confirmation dialog and I get the coupon. And I uh, show it in my HTML. Huh? What do you think? Oh my God! I mean, I was like, "What?" First of all, uh, I am an old guy. Well, in my times, when you call the function, you expected the function to execute line by line until the end, right? No, <laughs> not quite, because it suspends here. How the heck? Interruptible execution? What the heck is this? Suspendable functions? I was like, "What?" You should take and show me this, and I was, "Huh? Wait, what? What? Go, huh?" So this function is put on hold. When, the, when this line actually is, is executed, until the promise here over here is, is, is resolved, and then it, it resumes the execution. But then, because I was so puzzled, my aunt told me, okay, let me show you what this really means, and look what she showed me. So basically, instead of a wait, technically speaking, it means that you are blocking until the, this promise is done. So then, I, I went on. Couldn't I do the same by just saying here, then, and then passing it a function that will continue the execution after this promise is resolved. And he was like, okay, do that. Let's see what, what it gets you. And look what it, get, what it got me. This is pretty much the same stuff. Be very, 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 very attentive. It's the same stuff, really. Then this await forces me again. The alternative, the most easy to, eat, to, to understand way is to say this then. And then again, provide the function which will resume the execution of the rest of the method. So basically, the rest of the method after a, after a wait uh, operation, I put in a callback for the promise on which I waited, on which I did a wait on. This also means this kind of this, this part of here. I can translate to then, and then do exactly the same. But this time, I need some coupon code, and then say arrow and then open, I mean, not even need to open anything because it's just um, a single line of code that I need to put inside. But the point is, it's all dense. Then, 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 all right? Like those boring stories that your grandpa told you, then we did that, then you did that, then, 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 and you thought, oh, okay, okay. So let's, let's first see that this works, right? Submit, yes. Oh my God, it really works. So it's, it's essentially the same stuff, right? but way more complex, right? Because we all, um, so the older of you now try uh, start to shiver because they recall those times in which you did success equals, success equals, in callback and callback and callback and callback. This is the callback hell, my friends, right? When you had a lot of de deeply nested callback functions, just one uh, waiting for the other. But actually, this is why promises were, were invented in the first place. So basically, this then that starts here, you can safely take from here. If you be very attentive what I'm doing. I will return this promise instead. So if from a then you return another promise, you can chain the promises one after the other. Again, I will do this. 
So if you return the very promise here, then you can chain again on that one. So you can chain your executions one after the other. And this is pretty much the same stuff. Let me check that. So um, now the, the whole point of this talk is that, to me, the most complex things front-end ever, ever handles, besides components and using the latest framework out there, uh, is basically asynchronous. And this is one of the toughest challenges for front-end, and it's very, very important how you handle that. It works with chaining of bends, not with callback health, right? So this actually, okay, now I understand. Although it's horrible, the first form is a lot more simple to read, but it requires you to understand that this is actually the, the equivalent. And now, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, let's try now to uh, use the sync away syntax uh, with our range on init method. So we saw that in order to use the sync await, we need to have promises. The sync await doesn't work with observables. So the uh, equivalent of uh, fork join in promises, it's promise all that uh, accepts an uh, array of promises and uh, it returns uh, all the results when all of them are done. So I'll put them in an array and I will also make them promises. And instead of subscribe, we'll just use them. And let's see if this still works, if it's still loading our data. So it still works. And now, uh, what we want to do is to uh, wait for promise all to finish and then execute this code. So we remove this outside of the callback. We'll remove the then. And we'll just say let DTOs equal await the promise all. And we also need to mark the method as a sync. And let's see if this still loads our data. Also, what we can do here, um, we can uh, use object destructuring. Uh, it's a new feature in, in JavaScript. And what we need to do is declare our uh, user variable before uh, the call to the backend. And then here, instead of having this local variable, we can just uh, say the results that you are come that you get from uh, promise all, uh, put them in this array in the variables in this array. So user and this punk countries, and I no longer need the DTOs variable. and it's still loading my, dat my data. Okay, object destructuring, promise all, and I think, wait, all in one function. Huh? It was his idea. Most of this talk is his idea, by the way. So, now, what the heck, what the heck happened, right? That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, first of all, clean code plus type script equals love, uh, equals don't pass fields from the controller to methods within the same controller. It's plain stupid, okay? Just, it can get them itself. Then, don't do subscriber and then in the callback, another subscribe, or the equivalent, then, 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 then. Don't do that in the, by building those, those triangles, those deeply nested callback healths. Don't do that. Instead of that, just chain them together, or even better, extract them in separate methods like we've done, if you remember. We've broken up into smaller methods, and we've just called those in turn. Put names in your code, right? Then learn the API, the array API. This function, you can, this line, you can rewrite, if you did not know the array API, in six or seven lines. Just find the, the, the country, what's that? The country with the, uh, the ID equal to user country ID. It's super, super easy. It saves you a lot of stupid code to write. And also, whenever you want to put some variable, don't put it on the class level. Put it inside your method in front of your eyes. Localize your field, your data. Now, we've played with promises and observables. Promises are actually, uh, promises are formally known as, the, as the dollar Q, right? Maybe some of you know that, and the other comes from the Erix universe. Promises are one async event, just one async event which I expect to happen, one. 
Observables are streams of asynchronous events. That's why the fact that Angular gives us back observables when you do an HTTP request, it's counterintuitive because that observable that you get from, from, from dollar HTTP is actually going to fire just once. Make sense? You won't get two responses from a, to a single HTTP request. So technically, that's why Marian could degenerate the observable to a promise when he did to promise. Remember? He just kept doing dot to promise and then converted the observable to a single event, actually, that, uh, uh, that he awaited. Now, promise all the equivalent is fork joining observables, but the difference is you can only work with a single weight using promises for now, and the observables um, are the, have the advantage that you can cancel them after you've fired them. Okay? However, there is more. We've played with, with bound Pr uh, promises to UI events, right? And when we did that, and some of you had these eyes like this when we did that, what is he doing? But basically, I created a promise which will resolve when the on click happened. We assigned, we overwritten actually the on click function of this button to do resolve our promise. Creepy, I agree. The most correct way would be to bind the clicks on a button to an observable because actually clicks on the button are really an undefined stream of asynchronous events in the future. That's the correct mapping. But to our purposes, we just needed one click on that button to happen. That's why we get away with promise. We saw that we can uh, generate our uh, data structure using uh, the documentation we get from Swagger. Um, we, it's like uh, checking at compile time that uh, you are still uh, calling the, your API with the right parameters. And also, uh, it will help you keep in sync uh, your API. Uh, we also generated the, the data structure from the Swagger definitions, and we never uh, use any in uh, in our code uh, because that uh, that help uh, help us to to find the errors more quickly okay. also for uh, every endpoint in swagger uh, you can see that we get the endpoint the name of the method also all the parameters that we need and the return type of that call. And uh, also all the information that uh, we need to, to create our data structures, like the name of the fields, and also their types. So this is generated. By the way, there will be a Git link that we will put at the end on, on the screen, where you can take the tool and play with it yourselves. Now, what I've done? From your way, because I was so afraid of that, I was so scared of that, I degenerated this solution, basically taking everything that followed an await and, and then putting it in a separate then. But the point is, this function will suspend its execution when you reach the await, and in case from that promise you needed something back, you can get it by taking the value that await returns you. So it's a more sequential way of working with asynchronous processing. This is equivalent to doing then and putting the rest of the function in the, in the callback in the again before of, because of this await, I did this again and basically nesting them, then, then within themselves, but it's better yet to serialize them then, 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 chaining the promises one after the other. This is why promises were really invented, right? So, that's actually what we've done today, but the most important point is to learn to do elegantly multiple tasks using one single thread, like in this example here. Learn to do many things with one single thread in an elegant way. Now, you are quite out of time, but if there are any other questions, maybe we can handle several now, yes? Yes. Yes. This is, before we, before we hit the first await, this is sequential code. Everything will execute sequentially. Then, yes? 
Yes, correctly. Then you put it here. No, like when you use before you join, you want to fork. You, you, you want to fork. Well, uh, this is not the case of promise all. We did actually did promise all, right? We did that once. So we also with a sync await, it worked. This is just sequen serialized, sequentializing the code for an asynchronous processing. It's not the same, the same thing. OK, now. Um, we have some nice projects back home. If you want to join us, feel free. Then, if you have encountered want some trainings, there you go, a nice site I've run into. Uh, but the, the best part is, yeah, I post daily on the best part is I, that I got you some stickers, but in decent order, I want to get, if you, I, don't, I bought a bag with stickers, with that kind of stickers. If you want to get some, maybe let's go out because the next speaker needs to set up here, and you can take one sticker for you, and I don't know, if you are the type that stitches t stickers, I don't know. So, ah, I'm decent. That was it, thank you. <laughs>